this week's installment of our 2023 Harlow Summer Seminar Series, and our seminar today will be given by Dr. Grant Hopcraft. Dr. Dr. Hopcraft is a senior lecturer in conservation ecology at the University of Glasgow. He leads the Serengeti Biodiversity Program, where the program has been collaring and studying migratory wildebeest, zebra, and eland since 1999. Dr. Hopcroft also acts as a scientific advisor to the Tanzania National Parks, Tanzania Wildlife Research Institute, and the Frankfurt Zoological Society, as well as an advisor to UNESCO World Heritage, IUCN, UNEP, Convention of Migratory Species, and several other East African focused organizations. So he does an incredible amount of good work. I'm happy to have him. I can't tell you the number of folks from the Global uh, Initiative for Ungular Migration who came up to me tonight and were like, I'm so excited to hear Grant talk. So I feel like we're really lucky as members of the general public to have somebody talk who, who has like members of his, very close members of his field who are thrilled to hear him speak. Um, one of the other things, especially for our um, sort of regular seminar attendees, I know my, most of you probably got our seminar list and sort of was like, we're having a talk on the Serengeti, but but it, we're in Wyoming, what's going on? Um, and one of the things that is really interesting, and, and I'm sure that the global uh, initiative for ungulate migration folks have been talking about this quite a bit during their meeting, is that these large migrations of animals happen all over the world, and they're terribly important ecologically. And as we, as humans, increasingly fragment our environments, we are making it harder and harder for those migrations to happen. And one of the places where one of those, several of those actually really important migrations happen is here in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. So this is a really cool topic just for, you know, the sake of our learning and interest, but it's also terribly relevant to the area that we're currently in. Um, so, yeah, so I think that's I think that's all I intended to say. Hopefully, um, I, we will have a Q and A session at the end of the talk, so we'll please save our questions for Dr. Hopcraft until the end, unless it's something like you're having trouble hearing or can't see something. Um, and for Zoom folks as well, if you would put your questions in the chat, then I will try to relay those as other audience members ask questions as well. Um, and with that, I'll give it to Dr. Hopcraft. Thank you so much. Figure out how this thing turns on. Is that, is that going? Uh, oh, no. I guess we need this for the Zoom. Yeah. Uh, does it sound like it's. Uh, yeah, there you go. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, well, thanks very much for the introduction, Hillary. That was great. And thanks for the cooking, too. And, uh, And, and also thank the boss for the introduction. It sounds like an obituary to me. <laughs> and also thanks to the GUM, uh, our global initiative of ungulate migration participants here. I, I don't know if any of you realize this, but for most of the crowd here, it's about two o'clock in the morning. So if, if I, I will not feel offended if you drift off for a little while, <laughs> that's, that's totally fine. That's totally fine. Um, okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about the Serengeti. The Serengeti is probably one of the most iconic ecosystems in the world, um, and yet, uh, and yet, it's unique. Um, and this week, we've been talking a lot about ungulate migrations all around the world. And one thing that's coming out is that they're collapsing. They're collapsing around the world at an incredible rate. We're losing our ungulate migration. And so, what is it about the Serengeti that makes it so special? Um, one of the things I was hoping to address today is thinking, well, maybe it's special because it's one of the last places on earth where we can still see an animal migration, a terrestrial animal migration that were once so common around the world. Maybe this is just a, a situation that's special because we can see it. Of course, the other side of it is that maybe it's special because there's something about the natural history of this ecosystem that allows the diversity and abundance of, of species that we actually observe. And so what I'd like to do uh, is kind of walk you through a little bit of um, a reflection, I suppose, of the research that's been happening in the Serengeti for the last 50, 60 years, primarily by Dr. Tony Sinclair, who's here. He's started the Serengeti Research Project in 1964. <laughs> and I have to say, uh, Tony's first PhD student, John Frixell, who's also next to him. <laughs> So a lot of, there's been a huge amount of research done in this ecosystem. And I think one of the things that 
I want to sort of walk through is a reflection on the on the on the research, but also a reflection on some of the management decisions that have gone into this ecosystem, and and trying to understand what is it about the system that makes it so special, and are there lessons that we can maybe learn from the Serengeti ecosystem that could be applied for other areas. So one of the things about uh, about Africa is oh is this does not, oh, maybe I have to click over here. Do I have to click on this first? Let's try that. Oh, here we go, got it. Oh, got it. <laughs> Thanks, Hillary. <laughs> One of the things that's really incredible about Africa is the diversity of ungulates. There's 259 species of ungulates around the world, and 101 of those species lives in Africa. But Asia takes the cake. Asia, has 113 species of ungulates. So even though we think of Africa as incredibly diverse, we never think of Asia as having this diversity of, of ungulates, but it does. I, I like starting with this picture because I don't know if you've noticed, it's not a great picture, but one thing about it is that there are six species of animals all eating grass in this one photo. Every single one of these animals just eats grass, right? So here we've got the beans, bean grass, um, you know, the in the back, um, in the front, Toki, Grandis is now the Six different species in one frame where of, of ungulates. There's not many places in the world you can do that, right? What I've plotted out here is all those 101 species of ungulates that we have across Africa, there's a small group of them that actually migrate. And what I've got here on this map, I'm just pulling out the distribution of the species that we know migrate in Africa. That's not where they migrate. All we know is that that species exists there. We don't know in most instances where they migrate, okay? When we start doing an assessment of migrations across Africa, one of the things we have to notice, this is, uh, this is a map of Africa migration. One, each of these black lines represents a migration. Okay, but one of the things you notice is that most of these migrations are occurring across what we call a resource gradient. A resource gradient for Africa generally means a rainfall gradient because rain brings grass. And that gradient has to be small enough that the animal can actually detect it and move across that, that landscape within a year, right? So what you notice is that most of these migrations are actually occurring across these rainfall gradients. Okay, right, okay, so what we see uh, for most of, uh, most of this is that we see these migrations. Unfortunately, pretty much every one of those black lines no longer exists, right? That's, and that's the reality. Pretty much all of those black lines, the migration no longer exists. And that's either because the animal itself is extinct or there's such low abundance that they can no longer move, they no longer need to move, okay? And so the, even though the species might still be there, the, the migratory behavior is gone and wrong. And so of course this leads to the question, well, what is it about the Serengeti that, uh, that, that, that still persists? Why does it the Serengeti migration still persist in the, in the, in the, you know, when we're looking at these types of things? So I'm going to zoom into the Serengeti ecosystem. I want to point out a few things before we begin. Um, that's the equator. So the Serengeti lies just below the equator, about two degrees below the equator. The only thing I want to point out is this right here. That's Lake Victoria, the largest inland lake. Okay, it's a huge body of water. It's just the east of the I'm sorry, just the west of the Serengeti. On the east of the Indian Ocean, the only thing I want to point out is that Africa is actually made up of two tectonic plates, and we're, we're going to get back to this. And these tectonic plates are actually separating right along the rift valley. The rift valley splits right now, like this. And the Serengeti sits pretty much right on the edge of the rift valley. And that's an important thing to remember. So we have the Nubian plate and the Somali plate that are slowly drifting apart. The other thing I want to notice is that this is the world's longest river. That's the Nile. Draining out from Lake Victoria, you think it'd be much quicker to do that, but it's not such the entire length of Africa. Um, and that's kind of a recent event as well. Um, um, so basically, the Serengeti is sitting on these high altitude plains 
um, in, 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 on the East African area. And it's great, actually, in the Lake Victoria, that water drops in Serengeti. Pretty much heads to the Mediterranean. I mean, it's used along the way, but it's connected to the Mediterranean. So if we zoom into the Serengeti, this is what the Serengeti ecosystem looks like. I want to point out another thing here, and that is that we've got an international boundary that lies right across this ecosystem. The north side is Kenya, the south side is Tanzania. Now, the Serengeti is a highly migratory system. It's a migratory system, right? What we what we see here is this incredibly dynamic. If I go in one more slide here, each one of these dots, each color dot represents a different species. Okay, so the red dots are Tunisian tagged wildebeest. Okay, and these wildebeest are traveling from the south end to the very north end. That's about two hundred and fifty kilometers. Uh, somebody's going to have to do some translation for me. In uh, that's two fifty kilometers in miles. The new 150, 150, crowd, 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 distance of the wildebeest migration is about 600 kilometers. But if you actually tag an animal and you measure how far it goes, it does about 2,500 kilometers. So 1,500 miles ish. Yeah. <laughs> in, in a year. Okay. That's, that's what I was saying. <laughs> Um, okay, now, along with the wildebeest migration, we've got about 250,000 um, zebra that might here. So the wildebeest themselves are about 1.3 million animals. The zebra, about 250,000 animals. And they're migrating along with the wildebeest. That's these purple dots here. You can see an inlet here. So they're migrating up and down. In addition to that, there's about 200,000 to 300,000 gazelle. Thompson's gazelle migrating in the system. Um, we have the world's largest gazelle migrating in this ecosystem, and that's an eland. This is an animal that weighs uh, about 800 kilos. Oh, okay. 1,800 pounds, something. Yes, somebody has to have Google running, right? Just have the, yeah, so on the fly translate. Okay. Um, so it's a, it's a large animal, just under a ton. Um, and actually, this animal, we've just been putting tags on this animal. What we're finding as well is that these animals are migrating in the, from, from the southern plains out here into, northern, uh, into the northern part of the ecosystem. In addition to that, we've got elephants. So the blue dot here represents the GPS colony of elephants. And what you actually find is that the Serengeti is one of the few places on the African continent where elephant abundance is actually increasing. Right? We get all this like all this information, elephant numbers are collapsing, poaching pressure, all this. Serengeti in the last 10 years has doubled its elephant population, right? And the reason it's doubled is because elephants are actually moving in. Right? So here we have a system that itself is vibratory, but these animals are moving in from right across Kenya and Tanzania, from Africa, which lies right up over here, the monkey word across coming over to Serengeti, right? In addition to that, we've got a lot of predators that are also moving in the system. So um, these young lions, these young male lions have a phase in their life when they get kicked out of their pride and have about two year phase where they're nomadic. And what they do is they basically track the migration. In addition, you have hyenas, um, about 7,000 hyenas, and the hyenas have a really unique behavior, and that is they commute. Get this, they commute. You have a den somewhere in Serengeti, and then you run for a day to find the migration, you eat for two days, and then you run back to your den, feed your pups. So hyenas are probably doing four times the distance of what the wilderness is doing. They're doing this. When the migration's there, when the migration's there, they're doing this. When the migration's there, they're doing that. Okay. So you've got this commuting hyena behavior. So here's the system that's that's very, very flexible. And I, the one thing I like about the thinking about lions and hyenas moving is it's almost like a migration that sits on top of a migration. It's like a trophic interaction of migrations. Of course, on top of that as well, we have uh, vultures, that's these pink dots. These pink dots are these vultures. Quite often these vultures, if you track them, are actually coming in and feeding off different migrations. So these vultures would fly up to South Sudan and feed on the cob migration. So this is uh, an area of the Kasahun. Where is Kasahun? 
Well, here you are. Dr. Hoon's <laughs> study area in India, Japan, and South Sudan. Okay, so the same vultures migrating between between migrations. Okay. So the, the key point here is that is that these animals are moving, they're incredibly dynamic. The system is itself, you know, constantly shifting shift, shift and, shift and, and morphing. Now, this ecosystem is changing to these days, right? The boundaries are getting larger. Human populations on either side, right? Effectively, what we're doing to most ecosystems is we're putting an ecosystem inside the plastic bag, okay? And we're asking it to live. We're asking this ecosystem to live when animals can no longer move. I'll tell you what happens. When animals can no longer move, the ecosystems die, right? We lose them. And we can see that from Serengeti and we, when we compare Serengeti to other ecosystems. When animals stop moving, that's, that's a serious, serious thing. Okay, so I want to give you just a bit of an impression of the dynamic of this. I'm going to show you a little video here. This is a time lapse. Now, what I want you to see, well, first of all, just watch it for a little while. Overall, will be Thing happened over here, it's, it's taking off in a different direction. We've got buffalo heading the opposite direction of the wildebeest. We've got the sea over here, we've got I think, the water all the way in there, right? So it's you can see that there's a lot of activity here. So we've got different species, we've got different species moving in different directions, we've got resources, water, grazing. Um, there's something happens over here. I'll watch, I'll watch that again. So something's happening with the resources. Suddenly they vacate that area for some unknown reason. Right? It's just gone. I mean, um, we've got collective behavior happening here. I mean, individuals are not making a choice just based on the individual. They're making a choice based on what other individuals are doing. But I also want you to notice a few other things too. I want you to notice, for instance, the movement of the clouds. Look at those clouds. That's the Indian Ocean and Lake Victoria effect, having building these big cumulus numbers clouds that bring the rain, okay? If I was to run this for long enough, you'd see uh, fires flashing across this ecosystem. Up to 25 to 50% of the ecosystem burns every year, intentionally. Uh, and in the old days, Tony has records that up to 90% of the ecosystem burnt. If you were to run it for even longer, you might see floods. El Nino for East Africa means huge floods. You see this area completely flooding out. La Nina brings crippling, crippling drought. You'd see it dry as a bone, hardly any grass at all. The other thing I want you to notice, and Tony's going to appreciate this, Tony, I hope you appreciate this, is the age of that tree. Look at all these other trees. Look how young they are. You've got one old tree there and another old tree right over here. Tony's work shows that these trees probably sprouted during the ivory and slave trade 150 years ago, right? When, when the elephants were wiped out with the slave trade, these trees sprouted. And these trees here, probably 150 years old, you don't see very many other big trees. You see a lot of regeneration here. But the tree story um, is, is actually tied up with the wildebeest, with the elephants, with fires, with all kinds of things. So I want you to just to appreciate that. The tree story, Again, it's sort of reiterated here. These are a series of pictures from Tony, um, who's been monitoring some of these sites for a long time. And what I want you to look at is just this little red pollinator. Okay? 1980s, look how many trees there were. 1986, it starts getting thicker. 1991, thicker still. 2003, thicker. And in fact, if we were to continue running this series, it would go in reverse. And now we're back over here. So here we've got these forests pulsing up and down as well. So it's a living, breathing ecosystem changing at multiple different scales and at multiple different time frames. Okay, everything is hugely dynamic. So why why is it so dynamic? And what I want to do is just peel back the layers. If we're interested to know what's actually happening in Serengeti, we need to start peeling back some of the layers. And those layers start with geomorphology. Remember, we've got two tectonic plates that are drifting away, the Nubian and the Somali. Africa is one of the oldest continents in the world, and some of the rocks up there are about 3 billion years old. 
on the edge of Serengeti, 3 billion years old. Just think about that. That's way before the dinosaurs. It's long before any vegetation, right? This is when the Earth's surface had basically a, a biotic film over the rocks. It was like a scum layer, okay? It was a scum layer on the rock. And that's how old some of these rocks are, 3 billion years old. And yet, right next to it, over here, as these things are drifting apart, you end up with all these volcanoes. Brand new soil coming out of the heaven. All these ancient soils, brand new soil, right next to each other. Okay? And if you look at the soil pattern, what I'm plotting here is what we call the cation exchange capacity. So that's the capacity of the soil to release cations, the things that plants, plants need to grow. Okay? The elements that they need to grow. What we see is quite a lot of diversity of, of uh, soil fertility. Now, the Serengeti itself was basically established to, for the wildebeest. Okay, so the park was established to boundary the wildebeest. Now, watch what happens when I plot the perimeter of the park. It overlays exactly where the soil is. The wildebeest knew well before we did where the park was going to be, right? The wildebeest were telling us what's good and what's bad. Okay, so just want to see, make, see that again. You see the soil, you see the park boundary. You only realize that in hindsight. You know, we, we made the, the park, we, the, the humans made the park to protect the wildebeest, but the wildebeest knew where they wanted to go. Um, in addition to that, you have the rivers flowing westwards, okay? So they're taking all this brand new, brand new, highly fertile soil and pushing it down with these old, old soils. So not only do you have um, uh, you know, old, uh, old soil happening in big scales, the entire system, you have it repeated along these little micro gradients as well along the rivers. Okay, so it's this repetition of heterogeneity that we see. In addition to that, there's a, a huge diversity in, in the amount of rainfall, and that is um, the Indian Ocean sits over here, and it brings in the monsoon weather. It hits these islands here and drops the rain. And right behind that, you end up the rain shed. Okay, so over here, it's part of the river. The river over here, we call Lake Victoria, the biggest inland lake. And it creates some ice. And effectively, it blows back humid air over this end. So while this boundary receives, okay, what's that? I don't know what's that Google. Google. Uh, 350 millimeters. That's what I'm talking about. That's about 12 inches, 13 inches, um, 1,300 millimeters. So that's a huge gradient, right? And that's only happening across about 150 um, uh, uh, miles. I'm not so sure about that. I'm gonna, I'm gonna stick with kilometers, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. So soils and rain mean that you end up with a huge variation in the quality of grass. You see it's here, super rich. You don't need to find grass in Africa that is more fertile than this. And yet, right up here, you end up with grass that's super poor quality. Okay? So this gradient in soils and rain provides variation in the quality of the vegetation that's available. Not only the quality of the vegetation, but also the architecture of that vegetation. Okay. So in the north of the ecosystem, what is over here? Okay, it's a tiny boundary. Maybe that would be the thick acacia woodlands. Right? These are the woodlands that are sort of pulsating over time. Those woodlands that I just showed you from Tony's work, pulsating over time. But then the ecosystem in the air is very fine. Down in here, you end up with these long grass plain areas. Okay, this is an area where the grass grows to be, I'm not even gonna use, I'm just gonna use my body height. How's that, right? All right, grass about that high, right? Grass about that high. And as you go further on south, with these volcanic plains out here, with these volcanoes spewing ash, um, you, there's, that ash creates a, has created a hard pan, very shallow soils. And you end up with grass that looks like a giant golf course. Okay? This area here, is about 2,300, 2,500 square kilometers on golf course. Imagine a golf course that goes on for 2,000 square kilometers. That's what is happening down here. Super fertile, very stable. Okay, 
So in addition to that, I want to give you a couple other things, then we're going to start talking about wildebeest, I promise you, I promise. <laughs> um, that's really interesting. Is the is a piece of terminalia woodland. This is broadly this is the furthest extent in Africa of a terminalia woodland, which suggests that at one point the Serengeti may have well have been a terminalia woodland as it recruited to these little islands, these pockets of terminalia. Another really interesting thing is they end up with these pockets of riverine woodland. And the trees we find in here are closest. Closest relatives are lowland Congo trees from on the other side of the Congo. So during the last glaciation, about 10,000 years ago, Africa was a lot wetter. We think what probably happened was that this was all covered by lowland Congo forest. As the glaciers receded and Africa became drier, those forests receded, leaving these little pockets. Okay, now. The issue is, is that I've painted a story of this huge amount of heterogeneity, vegetation heterogeneity, it's changing, it's dynamic, it's really mo mobile. How do animals respond to that? Okay, this is the abundance of wildebeest over time. Okay, so what we have across the, the bottom axis here is time, it's 1955, 1958, bottom goes all the way. Actually, I should have extended this because Alex and I just finished the Willoughby sentence. There's Alex in the front row here. So I should have concluded 2023. Sorry, my bad. Um, but um, what we've got in the number here is the bonus. Okay, so there's one point two million animals. We don't need it for one. Alex, yeah, it was with the calves, Tony. So it was with it. 1.5, but we've got to recalculate that calves. So probably about 1.3 is what I'm thinking, something like that. So it would be somewhere around the middle. Okay, now this this looks interesting, but the big question is, what happened? What? The story here, and this is again, I'm stealing Tony's thunder. Tony should be telling the story because this is a lot of his work, is probably the most uh, important um, virus ever to hit Africa, and that's Rinderpest. It's related to the measles. Um, Rinderpest came to Africa in about 1890. It took about 10 years to sweep from the north to the south, and with it, it killed about 90% of the livestock population. 90% of the livestock. And with the livestock, Anything that kind of looks like the livestock, anything even toed, ungulate, gone, right? Now that was tragic because that turned the food base out for most of Africa. It was the biggest, uh, not, the biggest um, epidemic really to hit Africa. COVID has nothing. Africa lost probably half its human population, maybe even more, okay, of its human population. There was mass starvation all across Africa. Uh, and Rinderpest continued to, to circulate. In 1958, Walter Barwright developed the vaccine. Now, the story is, Walter needed to test his vaccine, okay? So he thought, well, what we need to do? Clearly, Rinderpest is coming from these damned wildlife, right? The, the enemy is the wildlife. And so what he did is he created a cordon sanitaire, a ring around the entire Serengeti to block the disease coming from the wildebeest out to the livestock, right? That was his plan. And you know what happened? The exact opposite. He discovered that actually Rinderpest was going the other way. It was coming from the livestock and infecting the wildlife. The wildlife were not the enemy. Okay. And as soon as he did that, nobody documented this massive disruption of animals. Now, in 1970, there was a concerted effort to actually cap the number of animals, put a put a lid on them. I mean, we have to we have to control this population. 800,000 animals, where does it stop? You know, it's going to ruin the ecosystem, right? That's what people were thinking. There was plans for meat packs. And luckily, the, the first prime minister of Tanzania, Julius Nyerere, said, no way, we're not going to do that. We're going to let it go. We're going to let it go. And of course, the Western world was thinking, you know, we are, we, we, need, to, we need to control the environment. We need to control this. We need to cap these numbers. And what they decided was, but it's actually, the it regulates itself. It looks after itself. 
If you want to find out more about that story, I would really suggest Tony's book. <laughs> 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 Please, like little others. Um, yeah, and I'm sorry, you can all talk to Tony. Okay. Okay, so now I want to try and um, imagine, to imagine 1.2, 1.3 million animals, okay? I don't quite know how to do that. So I was thinking about how do I, how do I appreciate 1.2 million or 1.3 million? I thought, well, I'll get some pictures. Here's a typical picture from the planes, you know? It doesn't really work. You need one that's a little bit closer. So I tried this one. Like, yeah, but that's, I mean, you look like that and then you got to look like 360 and it's like that all the way around. You know, you still don't get an appreciation for it, right? I mean, a million animals is hard to appreciate. So I thought, oh, I'll take a picture from the aerial sensor. So here, for instance, is ah, a reasonable size herd of wildebeest, right? And it looks like a giant amoeba across this landscape, right? That is all wildebeest. All the wildebeest, all the way through. In the back, these five inch ridges here. If you are flying, when we do the sensors, we fly transex about 30 kilometers, and you fly 30 kilometers, and it's non stop wildebeest. You turn around, you're two kilometers down, it's non stop wildebeest. You do that 40, 50 times, it's non stop wildebeest, right? Non stop wildebeest. Then I thought, okay, well, let's do a thought experiment. Let's take every wildebeest, right? And you take its nose and you put it on the bum of every other wildebeest. And you make that like a giant wildebeest chain, right? And you measure how long that is. Okay, so bets. Uh, how many people say it gets to the bottom end of, so let's start in Jackson and we're heading south, okay? Wyoming? Utah? Arizona? Mexico? I'll tell you where it gets to. It's a line up of wildebeest from Jackson to the end of the Nevada. That's the number of wildebeest in the long chain in one ecosystem. That blows you away, right? And for folks who are from Canada like me, I thought you might want to see it the other way around. Right? <laughs> <laughs> this is the Calgary, Yeah, all right. Right? Great Bear Lake. That is one of the cattle migrations. We've got a vinyl from Jackson, almost Great Bear Lake. That's one species in one ecosystem, one highly functional ecosystem, right? Now, these animals are, um, you got to think, okay, 1.2 million animals, how much do they eat? 4,800 tons of grass per day. 4,800 tons of grass every day. That's a huge amount of grass that that one ecosystem needs to produce every single day to support just one species. Remember, we've got 250,000 zebra on top of that, plus another two to 3,000, 200, two to 300,000 gazelle, plus all the other animals that are eating grass, right? Just in one ecosystem. Okay. So how do you think 4,800, uh, sorry, 1.2 million animals, 4,800 tons of grass. There's only one way to do it, and that is you have to migrate. You have to migrate. It's a natural system of rotation. Okay, so what we've got here, I've got some of our radio tracked animals. You can see them zipping around. Especially the last season down there, they're moving through, they're going to come together, they're rising, they're going to come around, they're going to come around. As the season's progressing, they're going to come around, Okay, so the animals are, are moving across this pulsing resource gradient, right? You remember these resources are great, are, are spatially heterogeneous, right? There, there's fine scale and large scale heterogeneity in the quality of the food, and it's pulsating. Every, every month it's pulsating, and in fact, every decade it's pulsating. The whole system's pulsing. And these animals are just trying to track the resource, right? That's what they're trying to do. Okay, so how do you live when you live? People always ask me, when do, when do the animals migrate? And you think, they never stop, right? They never stop migrating. You cannot stop because if you stop to eat today, there's gonna to be no food by tomorrow. 
right? You got to get somewhere else by tomorrow. And the, the other problem is, is that they're highly synchronous. So all the females need to produce calves and milk at the same time. So whatever food you're looking for, your neighbor's looking for it as well, just as, as much as you are. How do you live like this? Well, where do you give birth? Um, where do you breed? How do you die? So let's start with a how do you die question. Because that's kind of fun, right? Um, but you know, the, the one thing I really don't like about National Geographic is that the wildebeest will always die. You know, in the, in the, in the natural history, they always die. So natural, uh, National Geographic would have to believe that if you're a wildebeest, you die because of a predator, right? You die because you get eaten by a crocodile. You die because you get pulled apart by a hyena. You die because you get ambushed by a lion. You get you die because you're a calf and you get eaten by a cheetah. You get dragged up a tree by a leopard. You know, everything is trying to eat wildebeest. And so National Geographic would have you believe that this is what we call a top-down regulated system, right? That the predators control the number of animals. 1.2 million animals controlled by predation. They would have you believe the cheetah eat control them. They'd have you believe that these lions here are controlling them. But have you believed that, you know, like the situation when that's not a wildebeest, by the way, I hope you realize that. <laughs> Just to keep you away. And in fact, that buffalo got away. Can you imagine? So that buffalo, this is Daniel. So this buffalo dragged every single one of these lions into the river. It turns out cats don't like getting wet, right? So they left it and they survived. Anyway. National Geographic would have you think that this is a top-down controlled system. I can tell you from Tony's work, from Simon and Duma's work, from our own work, it's not. If you, we do a lot of post-mortems on animals. Every time we find a dead animal, we cut it apart to figure out how did you die? How did you die? And I'll tell you how animals die in Serengeti is you die of starvation, right? This is an ecosystem that's working not on half throttle, not on three quarters, full throttle full throttle. You live and you, you die. And if you don't keep up, you die of starvation. Of course, I hyena will eat you, but ultimately you die because you didn't get enough food, right? Okay, so how do, how do wildebeest actually survive all this? I mean, you know, if you're dying of starvation, how on earth can you breed and all the rest of it? So what I've done here is I've just created a wildebeest calendar. This is like a wildebeest Google calendar. It kind of tells you what you need to be doing at each st stage of your month. So here we've got and then I've also tried to illustrate where they are in the ecosystem. I'm matching that with this map over here. This is the map over here. So we're going to start at the top of the year, which is the calving of So, will the bees give birth in February, roughly? There's about a two, three week period. The more sacked here that don't need translation, we're talking numbers. They give birth to about 250,000 calves in about two to three weeks. That's 500 calves an hour for three weeks, 12,000 calves a day, 12,000 calves a day, 500 calves an hour. This is an ecosystem on full throttle, right? So they're dropping 500 calves an hour at this point. Okay. And they do it for two or three weeks. Everybody calves at the same time, which really means also that everybody needs the same food at the same time. Okay, so what happens next? We go into this wet dry transition. You can see the months here, February, March, April, May. The system, the system starts dying out. These animals are effectively forced off the poles because the grazing is getting so poor and there's no more drinking water. You gotta go and find food, you gotta find drink, right? The rains are coming. Your stuff. The other thing that happens right about there is the rut. Now, calculation here, 250,000 calves means that there's a lot of something else going on seven months earlier, right? In fact, Dick Essie used to call this the largest terrestrial orgy in the world, <laughs> which, which I thought was really funny. <laughs> so we have this, we have this donut. And you better hope when you're camped out, if you're not within, I'd say about five kilometers of the rut because you won't get any sleep. It sounds like traffic. It's just this giant hum of these bulls going up, 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 and it just sounds like a big hum on the horizon. Um, 
and effectively buffoons are harassing the females until everybody's bred. Okay, so then what happens is that the rising is progressing from these areas up into the north, which is where the Mara River is, where the crocodiles are, and at this point they stop lactating. Okay. What I want you to see here though is that a female wildebeest is either pregnant or lactating or both the entire year. The entire year, right? This is her past year, hasn't grown up, she lactates all the way here, well, she's pregnant and lactating here, right? And then she's pregnant all over the year. So these plants now are getting weaned. They're about eight months old, seven, eight months old. They're getting weaned. A lot of mortality. As you keep on going around, the transition coming back, animals start coming back down, they're through the woodlands, trying to break out into the short grass plains, they're trying to get back. They're trying desperately to get back, okay? Because what happens is that as soon as February hits, you drop your next cat, and you're onto the whole cycle all over again. Okay, so um, that kind of gives you a flavor of what's happening with the wildebeest. Now I want to shift gears a little bit and I want to just look at some of these long-term changes, and this is where we're going to kind of wrap up. Um, so we've been collaring uh, wildebeest for well, since 1999, and one of the things that we've been doing recently is take that entire data set and you divide it into two, one decade and the next decade, and you ask, where did wildebeest used to go and where do they go now, okay? These green areas over here are areas where wildebeest go more frequently than they used to, and these big red boxes are areas with that they're avoiding more now than they used to, okay? This is kind of concerning. What's going on here? This is not a random pattern. And so we have a number of things kind of going on. One of the issues is the Mara River. So the Mara River, and it's the only place you can get water. It's the only place where you get water from the water. Without the Mara, we're in big, big problems. And I'm gonna show you some data here. So I well, this is for all my colleagues in the in the Gume. Maybe everybody else is going to get a bit more. Yeah, just coming to the modern um, And one thing I want you to see is how spiky it is. And I also want you to see the number of times it's hitting zero. We we'll just need to drink every four days. The Mara River has never stopped flowing in recorded history, except within the last five years. And every year it stops flowing for a day, maybe two days. Maybe three days, right? It just stops. It comes right back down to, and it stops flowing. The big thing is, if the monitor stops flowing, the migration crash, for sure. It'll be like me turning off the lights. We're talking about 1.3, 1.3 million wildebeest. Everybody thinks, well, there's enough wildebeest for, for eternity. It'll go off tomorrow if you stop the monitor already. We'll, we'll drop by at least 50%. And it'll go within probably a week or two. You know, it'll be a mass mortality. So that's a big threat. The other thing I want to focus on a little bit, just a few slides here. Um, and, um, that's some of the things that that's the border of the Kenya right here. And what we're looking at uh, over here is the migration of what we call the low migration. This is Kenya's last migration that in, operated entirely within the boundaries. And I can tell you now, this is a sad story, in the last 10 years, it's gone, right? We, we witnessed this migration go, okay? And that's because what we have here is those purple dots are the movement of radio colored animals with Jared. Where's Jared? Is he around? Is he, oh, he, oh, you're still awake, thanks Jared. <laughs> <laughs> this is some work we did with Jared, um, lagging the animals, right? So this is what it looked like. This is where these animals moved in 2011. The red is the fencing in 2011, okay? That's the fencing in 2016. That's the fencing in 2020, right? And when you plot the movement of these animals in 2020, most of our colored animals died. Actually, a lot of them died in fences. You can see them just getting pushed right out, right? And in fact, this migration now no longer exists. In fact, Joseph is Joseph Agutu is here. Hey, Joe. Yeah, so Joe can attest to this, that that population has gone from about 120,000 animals in the mid-1990s to what, less than 10 now? 10,000 animals? Maybe? Yeah, or even six. Right, okay. So a complete collapse of the migration. What I'm showing you here 
But here, the core of these neural blocks is a choice for somebody. It's a law. It's very good. The bulk patches are areas that are closer to really big launches. Okay, this is these are locations where big launches exist. Okay? These are all the cases small the kinds of things. Okay, let's talk about the distribution of these launches. This is the distribution. This is the abundance of launches over time. Okay, so the idea is investing a lot in terms of huge spike in business. Now look at this map here. That's too weird to me. And that scares the bejesus out of me too, because Tanzania's economy is dependent on tourism. 18% of Tanzania's economy is dependent on tourism. And the risk here is if this chain is here, if we're going to start avoiding these areas because of finance and tourism, right? look at this. This is the core of the ecosystem. Because they're more poor than that, and animals are now avoiding it. Something weird might be going on here. That we're displacing these animals. This really, really scares me because, you know, on one side of it, you know, we could be losing ecosystems because of, you know, habitat loss. So, for instance, here, what I wanted to show you in this map, if you didn't talk about it before, you know, these migrations, these gray areas are the protected areas. Hardly any of these migrations actually were encompassed by a protected area, right? Migrations need to be protected. They need to be protected. So not only are we losing uh, migrations because you know, we neglect them, we don't pay attention to them. I hope we're not gonna lose migrations because we love them so much, right? Okay, this is a, a map of new infrastructure development happening across. Global estimates are for 25 million kilometers of new tarmac by 2050. That's paving the equator twice per month from now until 2050. That's how much new pavement is going on in the world. You're paving the equator twice per month, right? And this is a plan for Africa. You just look at that and look at the distribution of migrations and you can see why people are concerned. Okay, so a few concluding remarks. First thing is protect the entire ecosystem if you want to protect it in the migration. Um, the other thing is, is that these ecosystems are highly dynamic, they're constantly changing. We should not be managing for stasis. We don't manage for stasis. For any, what you want to manage for, for example, forces that allow for resilience, like animal movement, allow animals to move. Um, and these ecosystems will regulate themselves, right? The other thing I wanted to point out here is a lot of these ecosystems persist because there is there's commitment by governments and society, right? The Tanzanian government protects over 25% of its land mass. 25% of its land mass is under some form of protection. That is long-term commitment by, by. The other thing I wanted to say is that, you know, animals kind of look after themselves. When we're concerned about wildlife management, we really should be managing us, right? Okay, so I have a lot of funders to thank and collaborators, and of course, a really big team of people behind me as well. And I'd like to thank you for your time as well. Thank you. Uh, thanks to Dr. Hubbard for such a great talk. Do we have questions? Go ahead. You mentioned our resolution and also the Yeah, so I'm just going to put it back. Uh, that's okay. I'll just show you the Mara River slide. Um, there's a few things that are causing this that, that you know, and this is not my research, by the way. This is research done by a lot of other scientists. Mm -hmm. But the Mara River was really thanked by her health and safety research. One of the health from a highland forest in the Mara Forest in Kenya, but that up over here. And the other big tributary is the Talek over here. And these two rivers are the major health. What we're seeing in the Mara. Uh, was a deforestation, uh, a lot of illegal movement of people into the forest, harvesting trees, squatting in the forest. And what and that ends up happening is these forests sitting on top of the mountains effectively act like sponges. When it rains, they hold the water, they just let it trickle out slowly. And when you lose the forest, when it rains on these areas, it just woof, floods right down.
think the writer also did like that. And capture the older. So what's slowly, what's happening now, it's splashing down, and it's lower. What's happening is that what you're seeing on these flow rates is it's right down. That scares a lot of people in Tanzania and a lot of people too. Is, you know, the Mara River is really, really critical for this migration. Yeah. Well, um, yeah, thank you. <laughs> Yeah, so your question is, is, what does the future look like? What if we were to be able to do like a viability analysis of this ecosystem? Um, well, um, what we're seeing right now is a lot of testing. Um, and what we're seeing, uh, we can see, so we're interested, for instance, in resilience. So yeah, how resilient is it? In these areas inside, you measure when it rains, how quickly does it green? Okay, and when we're talking about green, there's an NDVI, for instance. When you're talking about green, there's two ways that that can happen, or two ways in which you can lose NDVI. One is that you lose it because it dries out, and the other one is you lose it because it gets eaten, right? So, two ways you lose it. So, what we're looking at is the rate at which this thing is going up and down, the NDVI is possible. And what you can see over time is that as agriculture and things are squeezing this ecosystem, the pulse rate of the NDVI is changing. Right? It's becoming more erratic. It is this high because it's becoming more squeezed. The case we got is that as the system is being squeezed, that the animals that once moved out into these areas, out of the area of the and out of the and other populations in this area, now having to concentrate more. So we can see the seeker system under pressure. We can definitely see it under pressure. Um, and we can see that also on a number of other metrics, I guess. So, yeah, climate change. Well, what do you get? Well, it'll change. Um, I think I think that's part of the thing of you know maintaining processes that allow for resilience. You know, climate change is is happening, and um, and I think when we're talking about ecosystems and how to conserve ecosystems. What we're really talking about is conserving the mechanisms that allow the ecosystem to persist, right? We're not climate change. If climate change, we don't know what the future of the Serengeti is going to look like. It might look totally different. Getting yeah yeah, drier drier wet seasons, wetter dry seasons. The seasonality shift is getting blurred. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, thanks for that question. Yeah, yeah. jump on that. So what I was really interested in how senior some of the local tree ones can do because if you're having the entire or not the entire region having in one like yeah. three week period. Mm. So I guess are those are you seeing effects as the uh, ecosystem gets more unpredictable? Are you seeing changes to the variability of that? Uh, well, um I don't think we're I, I mean Tony might be in a better position or John might be in a better position to answer that question, but in terms of the timing of the calving, we're not seeing that shift too much. I mean, it does vary year to year. Yeah. Um, and uh, and it probably varies year to year because what we see is uh, the peak rut happens uh, with the full moon. Uh -huh. <laughs> so it depends when the full moon happens and then you kind of calculate forward. Um, but, um, but what we are seeing is a lot more variation in the movement. So um, I, you, I don't know if you did that animation. There was a couple of points where you see animals kind of choosing to do different things. And that's because, whereas before it was highly predictable where the means are gonna be, now it's becoming a little bit more patchy. And so animals are forced to make decisions. And you know that might have consequences. If you make the wrong decision, it might, may mean that your cat doesn't make it. So yeah, um, yeah. So um, I really appreciate the, the deep geological and ecological context here. But this part of Africa is also very close to the you know, origins of humans. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, like I don't know, the grass creation in North Africa is a big part of our our own our own evolution. evolution. And so I just I mean basically oh. as one of the kind of like the human history. 
Yeah. In this environment. Yeah, that's a good point. So, um, uh, I don't know if people are familiar with Olduvai Gorge. It's one of the locations where the Leakies were excavating ancient human fossils, these um, Australopithecus and Zenjanthropus. Um, and the total footprints, footprints in the in ancient uh, volcanic ash that showed a, a mother, a father, and a child walking through the ash. These were these were prototype humans. <laughs> these were these were before before sapiens. That way, is called the Viking Age. So we have the colors that are the is totally like the footprints. So these are these parts of the world. I mean, animals in this part of the world evolved with early hominids, you know, and fires were a big part of that. Yeah. And that's probably why a lot of Africa is such sort of like a fire dominated system. Yeah. Thanks, Alex. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, I see what you're saying. So basically, you know, if this recovery here is possible, I mean, that, that would really have told us a lot about how we should drive more to the nations. Yeah, we're going to be locked down in here, probably. We don't really know. We don't want to know about anything. Um, and uh, um, I guess your question is: is if I it, it would well, hmm. uh, I don't know if it collapse the tourism industry, but it would be a huge loss. I mean, you know, I think I think tourists would still come because all that infrastructure is built. What are you going to do, right? They're still going to market it, but there is the potential that you know you could work on it. System. So you could recover it. Unfortunately, I would say that history tells us that we're not very good at making these decisions ahead of time. I mean, you look at the collapse of the cod fishery on the, on the east coast of North America here. We knew it was coming for decades. We knew the collapse of the cod fishery was going to come. And when it hit, everybody complained, right? But life went on, you know. And, you know, and the, the bottom line is, is that is that the generation that's born now may not even know what a migration, an animal migration is, may never have even had the opportunity to see one. And that's a, this idea of the shifting baseline, that you're born, you, you, you think the world is what it is from the time that you remembered it. But, you know, there's not very many of us who would remember it. Yeah. Oh, sorry, there's a question behind, but I'll come back to you next. Yeah, you know, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, so Alex and I were just been doing the census. Uh, he was actually showing me some of the results last night, actually. Um, so it looks like the drought hasn't really. Well, it was preliminary. It hasn't really affected the Serengeti population. And that's partially because the Serengeti uh, wasn't hit as hard by the drought as uh, as uh, Eastern Kenya and Eastern Tanzania. On the other side of the Rift Valley was really hammered hard. Amboseli, Savo, Nkomazi, uh, Longido, all these areas had massive die-offs of, of everything. But the Serengeti, probably because of Lake Victoria, Lake Victoria kind of generates its own weather pattern. And there was enough grazing and water that we probably didn't get hit as hard as the rest of, rest of the world. Sorry, I have a question. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.
Well, yeah, yeah. Well, that's gonna, yeah, exactly. Um, I think, I think the, you know, the the bottom line to that is um, is really strict zonation. It's really strict zonation. It's just saying that is the Serengeti ecosystem. These are the boundaries around it. You don't go in there. You don't go in there. You can do whatever the hell you like everywhere else, but these are no go zones. And we need to be able to do that, not just for the Serengeti. We need to be able to do that for a whole pile of ecosystems on every single continent. You just need to have an area where you say, we're going to let nature operate the way that nature needs to operate, but we just need to give it space. Um, and and I think fundamentally, that requires really strong governance and really strong zoning. And unfortunately, you know, we live in a lot of countries where where zonation kind of happens, but there's a lot of gray areas and governments change. And you know, we're Chiro is a forest protected area last, you know, last government, but you know, this one, we need to log this area. We need to keep people alive. But yeah. But where that where zonation is an issue. Well, yeah, there I mean there are quite a few places in Africa that are that do have quite strong zoning. And I think that's partially because their economies are so closely linked with these ecosystems. I mean, imagine for instance, um Imagine the United States GDP, 18%, almost a, almost a fifth of your GDP dependent on the national parks. Imagine that. I mean, you would, people would be shouting about oil and gas, but it'd be like, no way, protect the national park. That's where the money is, right? And that's what's happening in a lot of these African countries is that this is, this is a cash cow. 18% of Tanzania's GDP is linked to conservation. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you're, that's a good point. That's a good point. And I, that's partially because I think we need to be more vocal about the impact that these lodges are having. I mean, this is kind of just brand new. We haven't even published that figure, so, so please don't tweet it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, that's that's a good point. So here, I'm just going to flip forward to the um, to it's this slide here. So we've got all this infrastructure development, yeah. um, and it's a really good point. And in fact, I'm glad you brought that up. In fact, I, I hope that maybe you were the reviewer for our grant application. Okay, <laughs> that's exactly what we were writing. Um, is what is the demographic? They've got fundraising elsewhere, potentially, but do their crafts survive as well as, as when they had access to these areas? Do they themselves have enough fat to get through the All that kind of stuff. So although we haven't seen an effect in the actual abundance, um, at least we haven't seen it yet, it, we, we may well sometime soon. Of course, the other thing on those abundance estimates, I don't know if you're looking at the error bars. Yeah, those are pretty big error bars, right? I mean, we're estimating 1.3 million animals plus or minus 200,000. So, so it's going to have to have a big effect before we would actually be able to statistically detect that change, just because of the way we set this I'm going to, I'm sorry, I'm very sorry. I'm going to cut us off. Um, we're going to thank Dr. Hawkrock one more time, but also hopefully he'll be willing to answer other questions yeah. if folks want to stick around. And then also, I'm sure throughout the conference, we'll have more questions. Yeah. This is fabulous. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs>